Should marijuana be legal and accessible for adults over 21, Washington State would be out front in challenging federal marijuana policy if voters approve 502. Allison Holcomb, campaign director for New Approach Washington. Why is this a good law? It will end uh, somewhere between nine and 10,000 arrests for simple marijuana possession every year and generate up to $1.9 billion in the first five years after passage. Douglas Hyatt is an attorney who has represented medical marijuana patients for more than a decade. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone uh, that supports marijuana legalization more than I do, but this initiative doesn't legalize anything. You can easily take 10,000 possession arrests and turn them into 10,000 DUIs. Initiative 502 is a good approach to take because it can pass on November 6, 2012. They're spending millions of dollars running a legalization campaign that isn't a legalization campaign. This will have disastrous real-world consequences. It will strike not the last blow, but the first blow against marijuana prohibition. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today to announce a new initiative to the Washington Legislature to legalize, regulate, and tax marijuana or cannabis for adult recreational use. This initiative is the right proposal. It takes into consideration all of the public safety and public health concerns that voters have. It's at the right time, and it's backed by the right people. For 10 years, I've been speaking out publicly on this, and I'm proud to do it, not because I'm pro-drugs, not because I'm soft on drugs, because I care about the innocent victims in our society. The war on drugs has contorted us as a nation. It has taken what it means It has taken what it means to be an American, to live in hope, to live in dignity, to live in freedom, and it has turned it on its head. One of the things that's interesting about Initiative 502 is that for the first time in the country, we're seeing this cadre of former law enforcement and prosecutors. We're seeing public health workers and addiction specialists and attorneys who have banded together as the sponsoring committee of I-502. These are people that really looked at what Initiative 502 proposes and they said, we're willing to put our personal capital on the line to see that this gets passed. It not only tightly regulates where marijuana is produced and how it's sold and to whom it's sold, it also creates through earmarking programs for education and prevention and treatment and research. All of this amounts to a public health alternative to prohibition. I'm so excited that Washington can take the lead in helping our country out of this wrong-minded, very costly war on marijuana. The Treasury Department intends to pursue a relentless warfare against the despicable dope peddling vulture who preys on the weakness of his fellow man. This innocent looking weed is Mexican marijuana. It inhibits and distorts the action of the brain and nervous system. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. We must weigh total war against public enemy number one, the problem of dangerous drugs. Our spending for drug law enforcement will have more than tripled from its 1981 levels. Just say no. We need more prisons, more jails. I didn't like it and didn't inhale and never tried it again. Mexican President Felipe Calderon vows to continue the country's escalating drug war. I am not in favor of legalization. <laughs> We arrested more Americans in the last year than ever before, over 800,000 Americans, 90% of them for simply possessing a little marijuana. We're the number one jailer nation on the planet. At the heart of this is the prohibition approach to drugs. In Washington state, 3% of the population is African American, but we're about 19% of everyone in state prison, much of it because of drugs. Individuals that are for the legalization talk about the fact that there's a lot of people incarcerated because of lower level marijuana possession, and this will take care of it. And I think that's crap. The dealing of marijuana is still going to be illegal. Um, large quantities of marijuana will still be illegal. 
underage use of marijuana will still be illegal. The supporters behind I-502, I don't think been in the trenches of where the problems are. Police, search warrant, open the door! Illegal drugs and misuse of alcohol is a significant social problem that will not go away simply because we make marijuana legal. We learned from prohibition that uh, you know, you can have a law that's causing more harm to society than the drug abuse that it's trying to deal with. The abundant use of alcohol legally in this country is a disaster. The social costs are enormous. Simply saying that it didn't work for alcohol so we shouldn't do it for marijuana is a lot like saying it's just too hard. It's just too hard to do the right thing, so we're not going to do it. We're not simply saying the war on drugs has failed so let's give up. What we're saying is the war on drugs has failed and here's something that might work better. Unfairly, our failed policy has put enormous burden on law enforcement to try and uh, uh, win, if you will, to arrest enough people to, to declare a victory that's never going to be had. I'm saddened by the fact that I've spent four plus decades doing this and it's worse. We have an opportunity now to change course. But we can't do it until voters step forward and say that now is the time and we have the courage to do this. We need 241,153 signatures in order to qualify the initiative. The strategy is just basically being where the people are. I'm at the Washington State Ferry, I'm traveling from Bainbridge Island to Seattle. We're on the morning commute. Is there any interest in signing 9502 to legalize marijuana? Washingtonians are in favor of legalization, but it's a really difficult conversation for a lot of people to have. I-502 is a law that's been drawn up after many states have tried, many states have failed. California had their shot with Prop 19, got real close. The sponsors of I-502 have made a political calculation. The way that the prevailing winds are blowing, reform's coming, let's go with something that is palatable at least and that addresses some of our issues. And I think that was the intent of I-502's architects. California's Proposition 19 didn't set up a sort of statewide system for controlling the commercial aspects. It didn't say anything about driving impaired, which we know is something that voters are very concerned about. It was filed in 2010, which is not a presidential election year. So your voter turnout is not going to be as favorable on a marijuana law reform initiative. We're coming down to the wire. I think we would have all have liked to have turned in our signatures at the beginning of December and just be done with it. But it's close, and we're not quite there yet. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Steves, travel writer and your host. I've found that challenging one's own preconceived notions and engaging in open and honest conversations with others is one of the beauties of travel. Rick Steves has been an outspoken and eloquent advocate for marijuana legalization for a long time, and he's been unapologetic. When I first announced that I was going to work for the legalization, taxation, and regulation of marijuana, people like pushed me down in a chair and there's all sorts of cameras on me. And, so are you a pothead? You know, do you smoke marijuana? And it was like, man, I had just admitted that I was a child molester or something like that. There need to be more business people like that in this country who are willing to speak up for their values, put their money where their mouth is, and if people don't want to support their business, then so be it. Is it good for my business? I have no idea. Do I care? No. This is important, you know. I don't want to live in a world where everybody calculates what are their political stances based on what's good for their business. I'm concerned that our nation's war on drugs has created an atmosphere where people are afraid to talk openly about the issue. Fear should never keep us from advocating the reassessment of a law we believe is causing harm to our society. Joining us, Allison Holcomb, director of the American Civil Liberties Union's Marijuana Education Project. It's really embarrassing if you think about it because we're a country that stands for equal justice for all, and yet that's not the message that we're sending to our communities with the way that we enforce our marijuana laws. I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and went to school in the Bay Area, came up to Seattle for law school, and uh, funnily enough, during that entire time, never tried marijuana. 
I wound up going to work in the criminal defense sector, represented primarily people who were accused of drug offenses. And over time, I began to question why exactly our laws made it a crime to use marijuana. We launched with the hope that we were going to corral a lot of excitement to get this initiative on the ballot. It didn't work out quite that way. Today we are filing 355,000 signatures in support of putting Initiative 502, which would legalize, tax, and regulate the purchase and possession of small amounts of marijuana by adults 21 and over. It's December 29th. We have until tomorrow to turn in all of our final signatures. And we had our delivery today of um, about 355,000 signatures. It's a huge day for us because we've been on the streets since August 1st gathering signatures, and now they're all behind me right now counting. The present system is broken. It's not working. This is a new approach. This is a very exciting day for all of us. It's common sense. The polls are showing that there's great support for this initiative. And so I expect that the people will have their say. New approach, telling lies. We don't want your DUIs. New approach, telling lies. We don't want your DUIs. New approach, telling lies. We don't want your DUIs. Throwing patients under the class. criminal. Ethical and scientific. Why would the agency try to make criminals out of patients? What is shame? Shame. Shame! Shame! For the last 30 or 40 years, the marijuana legalization movement's really been a unity, a kind of a kumbaya spirit, if you will. Not because everybody agreed on the fine points of how legalization would be implemented, but more because legalization just seems so far off in the distance it wasn't really relevant. What we see in Washington state that's really unique is that you have the medical marijuana activists. It's not as broad of an initiative as they want. I think everybody agrees that I-502 will be historic if it passes and will certainly press the issue to the federal government in a way that's, that's really never happened. But the disagreement is really more on the DUI component and the no home grow component. So these people have come out of the woodwork, these traditional supporters for legalizing marijuana. States cannot write laws that conflict with federal law, so what New Approach Washington is doing with their taxation regulation, that makes it federally preemptible. Patients like us, we're driving down, we get pulled over, they throw us in jail. That's more taxpayers' money going out the window. It's a lot safer for me to be medicated than to be nauseated driving down the road. Some people are going to push back against it, and they're going to have this dream that they can grow pot wherever they want or drive as high as they want, and frankly, that's unrealistic. I'll just briefly state that while New Approach of Washington appreciates that other people have their own opinions, what we're here today to do is to celebrate the fact that 355,000 registered Washington voters signed the petition to put I-502. Lies! 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 I started covering marijuana issues through the medical marijuana industry about two years ago. The medical marijuana dispensary market was really just exploding here. By our best guess, there's maybe a, um, 150 or more medical marijuana dispensaries in Seattle. That's more dispensaries than Starbucks, in the birthplace of Starbucks. Seattle 2010 to 2012 was rapid growth in people's acceptance of this plant and the culture behind it. Patients were coming in uh, just out of the seams in the wall. You know, it was amazing. And they were coming in with all sorts of diagnoses. The medical marijuana industry in the past two years in Seattle has absolutely just exploded. And everybody is a medical marijuana patient. There are parties devoted to patients having a good time. All you can smoke, dried flowers, concentrates, maybe an edible. Every treat is medicated. Instead of fearing that, we took it and moved forward. If we actually made it look a little bit more like mainstream America was used to seeing it, then the perception would change. I knew immediately that coming into this industry, I would be perceived as nothing but a two-bit drug dealer. There are responsible business people in this industry that care. It's, it's not just about money. We're one of the dispensaries that opened up and took the chance and the risk. Flour, oil, tincture, butter, candy, soda pop, you name it, we pretty much got it. These dispensaries, they've got 
pounds and pounds of marijuana coming in. You have marijuana brokers and you have people who are gauging the quality of the marijuana and setting the price for it like any other product. And now there's a large patient community that, that have their own interests that they have to look out for. There's so many conflicting motivations in this industry. When you get all these people in one room and try to unify them behind one cause, like it's the makings of a reality TV show. Uh, Steve Sarich, I'm the head of the No on 502 campaign and the executive director of the Cannabis Action Coalition. Our goal is to stop 502. Uh, it is absolutely a, the most heinous new form of prohibition. Well, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of all of us greedy, skeezy, money-grubbing, monopolistic, prohibitionists, oh, and patients, I would like to thank you all for coming to our first official press conference. Well, we're all patients. Uh, that's the one thing we have in common. All of us here believe that there needs to be an end to the war on cannabis users. We just don't feel that I-502 will do that. The government has figured out that sooner or later the public is going to legalize marijuana. It's going to happen. But they've found a way to shift the criminal justice system to prosecute at a different point, and that is the driving point. They pull you over, they smell pot, and under the new law they won't charge you with possession. They'll charge you with DWI, which is a much more serious charge and much more difficult to defend. If I can't drive or use the only medication that works, I will no longer be able to hold a stable job. I will no longer be able to live a productive life or be a productive citizen of society. My job for the last 10 years has been looking out for the rights of patients in the state of Washington. Steve has always been a fan of a fight. You know? I definitely don't like him as my boss or a friend, but I support what he's doing. I have never sponsored a legalization initiative. I've never spoken on behalf of a legalization initiative. Uh, and I probably wouldn't have spoken out on this if it didn't so negatively impact all the medical marijuana patients in the state of Washington. The medical marijuana industry here is so lightly regulated and so chaotically regulated that um, it has um, created a bunch of problems for state, for police, and for lawmakers. I opened the first and only collective garden in Leavenworth, Washington in uh, June and closed it in August. I followed the state law by the book. I didn't just open the doors of a weed business. The U.S. attorney sent out a letter, not to me directly, but to my landlord, saying that he and I both would be charged with drug trafficking and a $500,000 fine and 10 years in imprisonment, and they would seize his building. The day I got that, I just, I decided to close my doors. I called my lawyer right away. She said when they send those out, they mean business and they will come. The Obama administration has been pretty tough on medical marijuana outlets, uh, both here in Washington and Montana, all over the, the country, uh, where you might have thought that they would have um, taken a softer approach. They've actually been more aggressive than the Bush administration. The federal gov government is very powerful. They can do whatever they want, you know. Um, it, I, I am scared. Every day we were open, the feds could have came in, the police could have came in. We put our foot out there and took a chance. Marijuana, possession or use in any amount is illegal under federal law. They have ranked marijuana as a Schedule One offense, which makes no sense to anybody who understands the science or the politics of it. It's very hard to move the federal government to acknowledging the medical value of marijuana. It's put in a higher category of danger than cocaine. In reality, marijuana is less dangerous. It's less dangerous than heroin, which is also in Schedule I of the Controlled Substances Act. We're not going to get to a legal federal marijuana policy for quite some time. The states need to challenge it. They need to challenge it one by one with laws that propose a regulatory framework and dare the federal government to challenge them. People think that it's just a bunch of drug dealers that just set up and they just want to sell as much as they can. And in some cases, that is the truth. But you can talk to even those individuals and they can tell you story after story after story of all the people that they are helping. I probably had anywhere from 10 to 30 people a day. People with AIDS and quadriplegic and paraplegic and cancer. I was at a city council hearing and the drug task force guy kind of stood up and said, I've never seen anyone with a legitimate reason to have medical marijuana. This is my neck. I'm infused at C4, 5, and 6. 
I have a really hard time sleeping at night and marijuana helps me sleep and I use it every night before I go to bed. Cannabis relaxes you. It reduces stress. And that people that have chronic illness, and I don't care what kind it is, they're stressed out. I was stressed out when I had prostate cancer. And the cannabis really reduced my stress. I used to roll joints every Sunday night, you know, for my mom. She's got, you know, Crohn's disease, breast cancer, Parkinson's disease. She started using marijuana as medicine. It, 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 it added years to her life. I've been fighting the war on drugs as in the trenches. I've been a criminal defense attorney for over 20 years. I knew the only way we were ever going to be able to protect medical marijuana patients was to make marijuana legal. I am absolutely one million thousand hundred percent in favor of legalizing marijuana. The problem that we have is that this initiative doesn't do it. I don't know what other definition of legalization you need, but uh, when you can go into a store and buy an ounce of marijuana, then I say that's legalization. If I pass you a joint after this initiative passes, I'm guilty of a delivery. There was a template out there for reform that would work for marijuana. We we'll just take all of the laws that you know make it illegal now, every single one, take them all off the books, civil and criminal penalties. The Initiative 502 campaign, I think, saw the previous legalization efforts and thought that they needed to approach this not from the left or from the libertarian approach, but from the conservative approach. What we had done had been pretty well vetted, both academically and by other reform people, and they just like, completely rejected that. I think it's understandable that there would be some frustration among some activists that after having put in so much effort, so much time into this issue, that um, if a proposal that is going forward in 2012 doesn't match what they had been working on for so long, certainly there can be some resentment about that. The entire thing is about getting a win, getting this first victory so you can trumpet it and say it, even if it's just a propaganda victory. We just received word from the Washington Secretary of State that in fact, Initiative 502 is certified and we're gonna to get to vote on it in November 2012. Hey Rick, how are you? I'm doing really well. Do you wanna know why I'm doing really well? Because <laughs> we did it. We're official, it's real now. <laughs> we're yeah, absolutely. We're in it to win it now, right? I haven't been this happy in a very long time, actually. Even even when we filed the signatures, yeah, I wasn't um, happy that day. Wasn't happy. It wasn't it wasn't complete. We're gonna have fun, and we're gonna try to get to bed in a reasonable hour and get some decent sleep. But I make no promises. <laughs> We just had this huge victory. At the same time, there's this sense of trepidation and knowing that now the real battle begins. To the voters! Today's the Gay Pride Parade in Seattle, so it brings out all sorts of people that believe in, uh, you know, uh, live and let live, and we're celebrating tolerance. Pride speaks for itself. I'm proud to be here. I-502 and R-74 are the most important issues in my life. What a great day. These guys all know we're going to be the first state in the country to legalize I've never been involved so intimately in a political campaign before, but I'm just getting in the mindset that, yes, we're going to win this thing. Looking at the 2012 election, we have these incredible ballot drivers. Presidential years are good for young voters and for Democrats and for non-white voters. We've also got same-sex marriage going to the ballot. We've got some very important progressive political campaigns going on in our state, so this is the perfect storm of getting everybody out, and it's also really important. It was courageous 10 years ago to speak out on marijuana. Now people are a little more sophisticated and they realize that uh, it's good citizenship to speak out. It's hard to bring change in government. 
dramatic change in government. We've been wedded to our marijuana laws for a long, long time. Why doesn't it change? I think it, it doesn't change because our politics don't allow it. I've had members of law enforcement come up to me individually and tell me I'm doing the right thing. And when I ask them, well, could they come out and, and say that publicly, they say, oh no. <laughs> oh no, because they'd be ostracized. We're afraid, whether Democrat or Republican, that you'll get pinned with a, with a label that says you're soft on crime. I don't smoke marijuana, I don't want to smoke marijuana, I won't smoke marijuana when it's legal. My concern is this, from a law enforcement standpoint, prohibition of marijuana has failed. I felt that I had a responsibility as a senior federal law enforcement official to say something about it and add to the public debate. So many people are smoking marijuana that police officers have an opportunity to arrest far more Americans than really ought to be arrested. We spend $14 billion to uh, enforce marijuana prohibition. Well, what are Americans getting for their tax dollars? They're getting the largest prison state in the history of the world. We have escalated marijuana arrests enormously over the past two decades, and marijuana use rates stay flat. They're not going down. By every measure, Americans smoke more than double the European per capita average, and the Dutch smoke less than the European average. We have spent 40 years and $1 trillion waging a war that's had no impact on drug use and has created a dangerous, violent black market that is undermining our communities. When you look at the horizon of organized crime, of interstate and international crime, the face of it was marijuana. The Pacific Northwest is a transient point where product comes in, is broken up, and it'll go to Frisco and LA and Houston and Miami and Chicago and New York. The federal government, the United States federal government has said itself that the majority of revenue flowing to the cartels comes from United States marijuana sales. We bear responsibility as the market that is funding those activities. We've tried for 90 years or more to stop its use and that has failed. It's time for something different and I think regulation, taxation uh, of marijuana, the control of its use is a much preferred approach. <laughs> Anyone who wants to get pot can get pot. You can grow it anywhere. You can grow it in your backyard. You can grow it in your garage. You can grow it in your living room. You can grow it in your attic. People are selling on the street. People's friends or friends of friends are selling pot. It can be inexpensive. You can get the best stuff that you want. Prohibition has utterly failed. There's probably a good 15, 20 dealers out here that sell weed, and they all make at least a couple hundred bucks a day. They're not paying taxes. So everything they earn is tax-free. It's already the second largest cash crop in Washington state after apples. So why aren't we taxing it already? We know that everyone's smoking it here. We're taking a revenue stream that is currently in the hundreds of millions of dollars annually. It's not being taxed. There's no regulation attached to it. We can redirect that stream of funding into legitimate, licensed, regulated businesses and taxes that will go to support our state general fund. Whatever figure you want to put out there that the state will sell it for taxed, there'll be somebody out there selling it for half that price. It's a balloon. That's all it is. You squeeze the balloon here, what happens to the balloon? It gets bigger somewhere else. How taxing something three times at 25 percent and then again another 10 percent, how that's going to wipe out a black market when we all know if you took economics in college that the way you uh, end up with a black market is over taxation. After the prohibition was repealed, the black market for alcohol pretty much disappeared. You don't see people outside of stores trying to sell you beer that they made at home because it's a dollar cheaper than the beer you can get in the store. They're not legalizing it under state law, so they know that these stores aren't going to get set up. This is an elaborate hoax. They're talking about millions and billions of dollars in tax money that they know is not going to happen, and they're using that to get it passed. Why are they doing that? I don't know, but they are not about to tell us either. Hate is the only word I can use to describe the loathing I feel for marijuana and any other illegal or exotic drugs. I despise it, I loathe it, I hate it. That said, I support the decriminalization, the legalization, the regularization, the taxation of marijuana because whatever was intended by this law, in practice, the war on drugs has been a war on black and brown people. I, I don't want to arrest my way out of the situation. I, I don't think that's right. I, whatever your color is, 
Putting people in prison has not worked. If you want to call this legalization, that will be illegal for any of you who are not patients. <laughs> is that illegal for you? Not. Is that illegal for you right now? <laughs> <laughs> He's not go. black, they ain't gonna arrest him. My <laughs> heart goes out to people who need medication, but that doesn't mean you also have the right to drive impaired. This is the drug czar's latest strategy for prohibition in the United States. My question is to Reverend Braxton. Don't you feel that, um, especially with the situation while driving, that they're basically opening the door with this gray area for more racial profiling? Cops currently, it is their discretion now uh, who they pull over, who they arrest. By changing the laws around marijuana and decriminalizing, it takes one of the most prominent tools that are used to be very selective in its application. And, and maybe for some of you in here, you're okay with status quo, because it's not touching you as close to home. My name is Keith Locker. I'm co-chair of the Political Strategies Committee of the Tacoma Pierce County Black Collective. African Americans and Latino Americans, you know, people of color in general are filling up our prison systems and most of their arrests are for nonviolent crimes. More white people smoke marijuana than African Americans, for example, but far more African Americans are arrested and go to jail for marijuana possession. African American youth, they are 20 to 30 times more likely to spend time in penal institutions than our white youth for being in possession of marijuana. If you have a bunch of people that aren't necessarily committing crimes, but you just don't want them in this community, um, then you take these kind of lightweight things and you make them a really big deal. It's not a fair law. It's a destructive law. It's a racist law. It's a tragic law. Rich white guys don't get busted. Poor guys get busted. Black people get busted. It really stagnates their potential, and, and it's, it's unfortunate because a lot of people do use marijuana, and everybody's not a target. During the time that I was practicing uh, criminal defense, there were a number of people that would cause me to pause. Um, these would be young people that had been accused of possessing marijuana, something that could derail that young person's life. I think that's when I really first started to see that I don't want to spend the rest of my life walking kids through a criminal justice system that's going to fundamentally change their lives. I want to see if I can do something about that system. It bothered me that young people could be arrested and have a criminal record for the rest of their lives. Even a misdemeanor marijuana possession conviction was something that could cause them not to get into the college that they were applying to, not to be eligible for financial aid, not to get the first job that they applied for, or the second job, or the third job. What you don't do is you don't give them one more way to target young black and Latino men. And a per se drug law is a perfect way to do that. This is a really important discussion to have about the legalization of marijuana and particularly how it affects youth of color. Washington State, we're in debt a lot of money and, right. and we, we, we have away. huge gaps to fill so we're looking for anything okay. to, anything. to and, raise and, and, money. The government is going to profit the most out of this regardless at the end of the day. My biggest concern is who's going to capitalize off the funding. Let's look at the bigger Business picture and make this into a business to where we benefit from it, just like they are. You would think that they would be shooting to do more positive in the community, right. but with legalizing it, you're putting more youth at risk. At risk. I'm under 21, you know, so I have all types of stipulations with it, you right. know? I'm a medical user, you know? Right. What's crazy about it to me is from 18 to 20, I should be able to smoke, especially if I can vote for it. 50 to 60 percent of the people that get caught with marijuana are already under 21. So you're right, a lot of it's not going to change. The people who are most vulnerable will still be affected. They made an open season on kids, so now a cop sees some kids in a car, pulls them over, smells marijuana, boom. You are going to the hospital. If there's any detectable amount of marijuana in your system, it could have been from a day ago, you're guilty of a DUI. No way out. They just won't harass you as much, and honest the truth, God's truth is, 
they're still gonna harass you as much. And this is gonna be the same as it is now. Me, him, and him, because we're dressed similar like in hoodies, we're a gang. So when you see me smoking this thing, you're not gonna come up on me because of the weed. You're gonna come up because we look like a gang. We don't think it's the silver bullet to solving the problems of young people who are arrested for marijuana possession, but we do think it is a step in the right direction. I don't care if you get it fixed down the road. You ruin one kid's life because of that stupid fucking provision. One kid is enough for me to say, no, I'm not participating in that thing. I won't sell out one single fucking kid for that piece of shit. This one's turning up the ready to pilots live the proof. No matter your differences, no matter the things they tell you. Cause we've been shaking haters, living like some humble hippies. Let's smoke a joint and get along. Is anybody with me? Hempfest is the world's largest annual cannabis policy reform event. It's been taking place on the Seattle waterfront since 1991. And uh, it's 1.5 miles of vendors, speakers, bands, music, freedom, and information. <laughs> called a protestival because it's a protest festival. We have up to 300,000 people come through these parks on these three days and they're here to learn about cannabis, to celebrate the cannabis culture, and to say that marijuana should be legalized because clearly no harm is being done here. In fact, it's helping a lot of people. Hempfest has been going on since 1991 with really spectacular statistics. We've never had a serious injury or serious case of violence happen at the event in 21 years. Attitudes in Seattle in particular have become increasingly lenient towards marijuana. In 2003, we passed Initiative 75, which made marijuana possession the city's lowest law enforcement priority. And even though law enforcement had dug in its heels a bit, the city elected Pete Holmes, the city attorney. Three years ago, I promised on my campaign that I would not prosecute another simple marijuana possession case. I have not, and I will not, as long as I'm your city attorney. When I took office, I found to my disappointment, but not really my surprise, that of the hundreds of pending possession cases, 59% of them were against African Americans. Seattle is a city with a 7 to 8% African American population. So it only confirmed what I had already suspected. I ordered all those cases dismissed, and we have not filed a case since I took office. I was originally appointed in 1983 uh, and quickly saw in my own courtroom that we're churning low level drug offenders through the system for no good purpose, ruining people's lives, and realized that the tougher you get with regard to drug crimes, literally the softer you get with regard to the prosecution of robbery, rape, and murder. This is an absolute waste of resources, it's counterproductive, and eventually determine that drug prohibition is the biggest failed policy in the history of the United States of America, second only to slavery. Unjust laws like marijuana prohibition don't make us safe. They undermine respect for cops who would rather focus on more serious crimes. Because of the war on drugs, this country jails more of its citizens than any other nation on the planet. Every American, regardless of your religious affiliation, your political uh, perspective, has to look at that and say that's shameful. The drug war started in the United States. It spreads around the world like a cancer, and this is where it has to end. It has to be killed here so that people worldwide will be able to follow that example. In less than 90 days, we get to vote, finally vote, to legalize marijuana in this country. I'm talking about I-502 and it must pass. Part of the effort of the legislation is to undercut the black market. The Liquor Control Board has the authority to regulate uh, those tax prices. This is the first time we've really talked about I-502, and so we were just visiting the no on I-502 tent, and then we just visited the yes on I-502 tent. Almost everyone I spend my time with is a medical marijuana patient. I, I read a lot of those magazines that were really pushing for, for no on I-502, so I just, I got scared. 2012 Hempfest was nuts. It was a battleground. I've never seen Hempfest look like this before. Uh, we are encountering a lot, a lot of opposition this weekend. Fuck 502! Fuck 502! I'm getting a lot of people who come in with, with, with faulty assumptions about what I-502 does. This is going to support commercial growing, big business. We are here 
trying to give information. Because there's a lot of people here who are against the initiative legalized after prohibition. We didn't legalize alcohol. We repealed the prohibition. Right. No, and then we legalized. That's what you're not doing. You're no. not re repealing prohibition. We absolutely are. Yes, you are not repealing level. prohibition. We're repealing prohibition. You are making it legal within this bubble. Sure. Yeah. My main fear about I-502 is getting pulled over and given a DUI for, you know, having a high tolerance. I smoke pot every day. Are you going to say, uh, hey, Grandma, would you please vote to legalize pot? And by the way, I can smoke all I want and then go drive? She's not going to buy it. We feel strongly that the amount of votes that they're going to lose from the cannabis community by implementing this DUI law is going to be far greater than the amount of votes they're going to gain from, you know, conservatives deciding to vote for legalization just because there's a DUI law in it. You're not pulling people here, you're not pulling these people because they wouldn't support you either. When I first heard about 502 as a legalization thing, I was for it, I'm not going to lie. I was 100% behind it. You know, I even asked them for initiatives. Um, but then I actually heard more about the bill and looked into it, which is ironic because they will say, hey, have you read the bill? And I say, yeah, that's when I actually changed my mind on your bill. Two to five million dollars made off of blood DUIs in the first three to five years. That's what it says in their fiscal statement. Yet they tell me that there's not going to be you know, a lot of DUIs, they're planning on it. It wasn't necessarily misinformation, it was just like, everyone that was for it just kind of swept over the details and said, well, you don't need to know the details, it's legalization, vote for it. Everyone knew that they were pro-legalization in their heart and they wanted to be part of that, but no one knew if this bill was the right thing for the people who had built the scene up to this point. Some of our weakest support, like soccer moms and middle class people. I feel like people. soccer moms are some of your biggest supporters, actually. Uh, I feel like you don't have the support of the true cannabis community. Well, it's, it's been seen, I've seen it here, you know, the last three days. You don't have the support of the heart of this city, the people that come to Hempfest. You have people that behind your booth that I don't even, they don't look like they even use cannabis. Seattle has always historically been and has legislatively become a really safe place for cannabis users. I think a lot of people who are here feel safer than they actually are. In the city of Seattle, we have an amazing, I mean, look where we are, everyone's smoking cannabis and there's nothing wrong with it. Why do we want to change that? The medical marijuana entrepreneurs who are opposing I-502, I don't think are telling their, their patients clearly enough about the risk that they're under now. Dispensaries in the state are not even legal, yet they're tolerated, you know. King County, Pierce County can go to dispensaries, but on the eastern part of the state, you can't go to a dispensary. Washington state law does not protect marijuana possession, even if you're a marijuana patient. All it does is give you a defense in court if you are charged. That's an expensive proposition for a patient, and the only reason those patients are not getting charged is a matter of politics right now. Patients are against it simply because what they're hearing from you know, medical dispensaries is this information, and of course the medical dispensaries don't want to lose their business. If their dispensary is saying, oh no, 502 is bad, it's going to shut us down, you're not going to be able to get your marijuana from us anymore, they're going to believe anything they say. They may have used this fear of you know, driving while intoxicated uh, and, the, and the parade of horrible imaginables that might occur. Uh, I think they were using that as a, as a smoke screen, pun intended, to hide the fact that they are very entrenched in the business of growing and selling on the black market and they're getting rich from it. This is a democracy and we know that large segments of the voting public that may not be interested in purchasing marijuana themselves are still concerned with what about driving while stoned? It's pretty good research that as the THC level in the bloodstream goes up, the risk of accidents increases. Everyone's familiar with blood alcohol levels. They vary from state to state, and states tend to adjust them as scientific knowledge advances. We wanted to treat marijuana the same way. After a person smokes pot, two to four hours are necessary before they are reliably below that five nanogram uh, limit. And that applies to medical marijuana uh, patients as well. The argument against the I-502 provision is that it doesn't deal with impairment at all. If you have five nanograms in your bloodstream, you are guilty of a DUI. You can't argue that you weren't impaired because that's not a factor. The science of drug driving is really kind of all over the place. But one of the things that's clear is that I-502's per se level is quite low. No one understands how long it lasts in your blood, truly. There's an issue because there hasn't been any federal research done that we don't have any good data. This is up on their website right now. You can download it. And what we did was we, we recreated the chart because it's, it's very hard to read. This is risk factors. One is no impairment. Here's five, and it's just below the line of no impairment. This only goes up to 20, and I, uh, and I probably wake up all over about here 
someplace. All right? So I guess I'm way up here on this chart. We know from experience in the 16, 17 national jurisdictions that allow medical cannabis that we haven't seen an increase in DUI prosecutions in those states, even though 11 of them have zero tolerance. You can't have your blood tested unless there's already probable cause to arrest you and there's already evidence that you're driving impaired. Medical marijuana patients who are currently driving aren't being pulled over because by and large they're not driving while impaired and I-502 is not going to change that. Every single medical patient I know wakes up over, over five nanograms every day. The therapeutic dose for marijuana is at least 10 nanograms in your system. They set the goddamn limit below the, you know, the therapeutic dose. Personally, I think that goes a little bit too far. I think that you need to prove impairment in court and you should be able to challenge it in court, not simply have the presence of THC in someone's system. But the truth is, is that Americans are rightly terrified of legalizing a drug that puts people out on the road on the other side of that narrow yellow line, uh, hurtling at them at 60 miles an hour. I'm Darian Clary, I'm 17, and I have MS, which is multiple sclerosis. From my neck down to my elbow, it feels like someone's holding a torch. Like, and it's twisting, and it's burning, and it hurts, and then from my elbow down to my hand, I totally lose feeling. I go numb. When I smoke a bowl, or when I medicate, my pain totally goes away. If I can't get to where I need to go, then I can't make any money. Previously, I've been prescribed Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycodone, Oxycontin, Methadone. When you're on those drugs, you feel like you're on cloud. When I'm on marijuana and I drive, I'm more focused, so I know what's going on around me. When I'm not medicated, I drive fast, I don't care about using my blinkers and being safe because I just want to get to where I'm going because I'm in pain. We're looking at people like me going to prison that will stay on your record forever. We're not just fighting it for the state of Washington and we're not just fighting it for patients. Their goal is to pass a per se DUID law in every state. The irony in what these critics of I-502 are advocating is that they're not actually hurting the initiative with a lot of people. One of the leading factors in initiatives failing, such as in Nevada and in California, is that people were concerned that people were going to be driving high. So you've got this tiny minority of medical marijuana patients who are screaming that there are these incredibly strict DUI provisions. And what the majority of swing voters who are actually going to decide this initiative care about is that there are strong DUI provisions. If the medical marijuana activists want to ballyhoo this issue from the rooftops and generate a bunch of media, well then go ahead. You're only going to convince the people that, that initiative needs in order to pass. Great social policy changes um, are not an easy sell. You have to convince your classic soccer mom that marijuana legalization is not going to lead to their high school student getting high on the way to school. I am very concerned uh, about juvenile usage and how that impacts the juvenile brain, how it impacts um, juvenile depression, how it impacts the ability to learn. From 2000 through 2009, we had a decline in uh, drug usage in schools, and then 2009 started up. I believe that's because of the medical marijuana. We're sending a mixed message to our youth. There are a significant number of people who don't engage in the use of marijuana simply because it's illegal. I asked my son, who's 21, I said, what do you think? If, if this is legal, will more people use it? And he told me, Dad, more people your age will use it because people my age already know where to get it. Young people have ready access to marijuana now but are very poorly informed about its effects on health and behavior. With tobacco, we've been successful at advertising restrictions, at providing science-based information to people. One of my major reasons for being enthusiastic about the initiative is I think it's going to do a better job than prohibition has done in protecting young people. 
Come November 2012, we're looking to pass the most comprehensive marijuana law reform measure in the world. This year, we're going to need to talk to as many voters as we can across the state. We need to be in communities, answering questions, making sure that people understand what Initiative 502 is and what it isn't. Tomorrow, we're going to pick up Rick and go on a week-long seven-city tour of the state of Washington. Well, this is the, uh, the big Rick Steves, uh, Allison Holcomb bus tour. Apparently, they're marshalling the troops down there now, so see what they come up with. Why people believe that this whole thing really is about legalization, I, I don't know. I mean, it seems like an obvious scam to me. We are in Olympia, Washington, which is the state capital, and we are um, launching the tour today. I'm like a little kid here. I'm so jazzed. I love a road trip, and this is a road trip with a meaning. Just the three of us showed up. And there was already like a little like group from the yeah, whole community there. Yeah, there was already 10 or 15 people there. A lot of those are patients from Olympia and Tacoma. Representative Sam Hunt would like to provide a few words and welcome us all to the state's capital. Representative Sam Hunt. We had um, opposition there that definitely wanted their voices to be heard. They were very loud and the rotunda is all marble with really high ceilings so the acoustics were really to their advantage. We kind of expected here at the Capitol in a public event we'd have the uh, fringe that's against us. It's impressive how five or six people can disrupt a, an otherwise constructive get-together. It's a bad plan. If I'm fighting this hard, you should listen to my. Why is she getting removed? of a good democracy is civil debate. Um, there was nothing civil about the rotunda. They only want their message heard and that was what that day was about. They wouldn't have had the melee on their hands had they not come and tried to throw us out at, at a free speech event. Hey, <laughs> we did make the New York Times. <laughs> you can see me right there. both medical marijuana patients and people who think that they're going to be legal. Five years from now, these guys will look back, and I don't expect them to apologize, but they'll look back and they'll see we were actually in their interest. I mean, if progressive insurance backs it with a million dollars, there's pretty much a reason for that. We've got the truth on our side. Uh, they've got the money on their side, and that's, that's really what this whole argument comes down to. The truth will rise to the top, and we've got the truth on our side. I think these people embarrassed themselves, and uh, it's certainly not going to stop us. We kind of expected this, and uh, uh, for me, it's uh, the way to kick off a fun road trip. Here we go. We're about three weeks before the election and uh, we're really kicking into high gear here. If our law succeeds and is smart like we expect it is, it will inspire other states to do the same thing. 
Washington is a fabulous snapshot of the broader American experience. We're going to hit a lot of rural areas that are more conservative and just put on forums. This should be a conservative issue, not a liberal issue. We're talking fiscal responsibility, we're talking civil liberties, we're talking to respect law enforcement, we're talking states' rights, we're talking keep the government out of my body, out of my home. I love it. I mean, it's, it's really odd for me to be waving all these conservative flags. I-502, what is it? It's designed to legalize tax and regulate the purchase and use of marijuana as a recreational soft drug for people 21 and over. Balled into this is this exciting opportunity to take a huge and thriving black market that is enriching gangs and organized crime and taking that money and taxing the heck out of it. I like to talk to conservative groups because preaching to the choir is kind of boring and we're here to make a difference. I don't know how anybody can look at this 40-year drug war and the grief, the pain, the discrimination, the racial discrimination, and be a person of faith and not do something about it, not want to do something about it. I'm a church-going, kid-raising, tax-paying, hard-working American. If I want to go home after a long day's work, take a few hits on a bomb, and just look at the fireplace for three hours, <laughs> that's my civil liberty. Rick Steves is giving a presentation today here at this church. He's one of the backers of this initiative. He's put in $350,000 of his own money. But I think if he knew how many patients oppose it, he may change his mind. Right now, like you said, there, there isn't a limit on, on the DUID, but putting that five nanogram limit on it is really going to paint people into a corner. Right now, it's zero tolerance. And I know you say, oh, you have to prove. It's zero tolerance. I've seen the cases on my desk, individuals that are less than five active nanograms of THC in their system that are being prosecuted. They're just talking out of all sides of their mouth. To the reform community, oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, this is legalization, this is gonna be a step in the right direction, it's gonna be great. If you were a soccer mom, it's over 21, your kids will never get it. To law enforcement, they're like, oh, that's how you'll shut down the medical marijuana business. They tried to have it always. I think a step forward is so important, and I think 502 is that step forward. You know, is it perfect for everyone? Probably not. We're on the same side. We are. And we got to figure this out. I know. I just want it to work. I do too. And a, and a step forward is better than a step it's back. It's scary. It's scary, but if we stay put, we're going to go nowhere. One thing I'm really enjoying about this work is I get to work with lawyers that are dedicating their beautiful minds and the hard work to an issue that's not just to make one of their clients wealthy or to make them wealthy. Put the camera back there on Allison and look at her going to town. She's at this 24-7. <laughs> Changing our marijuana laws is not about supporting marijuana use. Changing our marijuana laws is making our laws work better for our communities. Once in a blue moon, somebody will send me an email that says, I know what you think about marijuana. We're not going to use your guidebooks and we're not going to take your tours, ever. All I can think is Europe's going to be more fun without you. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a start. It's just the beginning. We're trying to make history for this nation here in the state of Washington. If we can get this through in Washington state, we can help our country finally become not hard on drugs or soft on drugs, but actually smart on drugs. Do you really? Yeah, I do. It's, it's nice. You know, it covers a still the broad it, it spectrum. Helps. You like that one? Yeah. Is that the one I should wear tonight? Yeah. Okay. We filmed a new TV ad on Friday. Yeah. That just went up last night. And we're finally starting to hear more from the traditional opposition that we expected from the outset of the campaign, which is, what about the kids? Pretty it is pretty exciting. <laughs> we need a new approach to marijuana. Young people have easy access since, of course, drug dealers don't check IDs. Initiative 502 brings marijuana under tight control, maintains strict penalties for selling to minors, 
and raises millions for prevention and education. Initiative 502, because it's raised so much money, well above $5 million, they are getting into people's living rooms in a classically political way that no other campaign for marijuana has really been able to do. They've done significant polling. They've looked at what the uh, Washington State voters' issues and concerns were. They've worked very hard to address those issues in, in a way that can make change palatable to the average mainstream voter. 502 generates new revenue for education, healthcare, and prevention. And if 502 passes, we'll have more resources to go after violent crime. Join us in voting yes, yes on 502. 502. They've put on a very slick marketing campaign, and that, that's all it's been is marketing campaign. It's designed by polling. They didn't have a principle. They didn't have a vision. They didn't have complete reform. They wanted to get some kind of win, and they had a commitment to spend a hell of a lot of money. The pro side in Washington raised 5.5 million, for at least four million of it coming from out of state. They've spent two million dollars just on TV ads. You have a, a cast of people running this initiative, which I think particularly appeal to the rich people that want to see marijuana legalized. You have a, a group of attorneys that present well in a room, and you have a bunch of former federal prosecutors who are championing this. These things all look good to out-of-state money. If we had 5.5 million, if we had 1 million, uh, it would be a very, very, very different race. We couldn't run a radio ad, we couldn't run a TV ad, we couldn't do anything, we didn't have any money. It isn't about the better argument, it's about whatever argument can be heard, and the only way you can really be heard is with just huge amounts of money. How many shots you put in that thing? None of your business. Yeah. Allison, Don't judge me. Allison used to have uh, lattes, and then she went to triples, and now she just does quads. The polls right now suggest that Initiative 502 is just maybe barely above 50 percent. The support and the opposition seems to be kind of hardening. I'm encouraged by reading some of the new polling figures, and at the rate it's going, it looks like we're going to win. I don't think they've got a chance. I wish I could do art. I need to learn that. Right? You should do a, che a check mark. Nice. Right? right? Or a canvas leaf. It's just getting more interesting, and it's getting close to the end. The end would be really good. It would allow me to actually do something else with my life besides this. Mwah. Bye, guys. Bye. Allison Holcomb, Douglas Hyatt, I appreciate you both being here. This measure would license and regulate marijuana production, distribution, and possession. And the question is, should this measure be enacted into law? The worst thing this initiative does is make some disastrous changes to our DUI laws that affect young folks. It's incredibly unfair, and it's going to result in the arrests of a lot of kids. And if you don't think that those kids are going to be kids of color primarily, then you're just not in the real world anymore. What Douglas is painting here is a picture of this world in which everything we know about DUI law enforcement gets turned on its head. And I just don't think that's realistic. Perfect is the enemy of the good. Why is this good if it's got all these problems with it? Initiative 502 is a good approach to take because it can pass. It's perfect because it can pass. Well, I mean, that's, how about just, the, that's just ridiculous. This is a, a badly drafted initiative that won't survive federal preemption. The notion that the federal government is going to come in and try to take tax dollars out of the hands of a state is laughable. If this was good, I wouldn't be opposing it. This campaign has misled people from the very beginning. All the they lawyers want, that have signed on as sponsors and endorsers are just Many confused about the <laughs> Sorry, on, you guys can't do that, on. so I'll do this. Let's take a break. <laughs> hey, good morning. Good morning, Jessica. <laughs> Good morning, Allie. Good morning, Tanya. How are you? Good. Awesome. Please state your name after the 
here that are uh, potentially going to be making national headlines uh, with same-sex marriage and decriminalization of marijuana. Now we'll start to initiative 502. We now have a 55.8% yes among white students. <laughs> and a very similar 55.4% yes among white registered voters. So it's tight, but we're above the we're above the margin of error on every single poll right now. Mm -hmm. um, anything could happen because there's only about a third of the ballots that have been turned in. So you don't know what's going to happen on the weekend. Everybody, <laughs> <laughs> we're bucking the odds um, that marijuana legalization is actually gaining support in the last week before the vote um, is a little surprising to me. Losing this thing isn't something we ever really considered. Uh, We've just focused on going out and beating it. I think that on November 6th, I think you might see Initiative 502 either barely barely squeaking by or just barely going down. It doesn't feel to me like a runaway campaign, largely because what voters are being asked to do is a great leap forward. Those swing voters are going to make up their minds sometimes in the final months or weeks, or they might do it literally as their pen hangs over their ballot. When you consider the potential effect, not just here in the state of Washington, but the eventual message that it will send around the country, if it passes, people are going to say, oh my gosh, how did that happen? Washington is a special state because we're all mail-in now. There's no going to the polls. In the privacy of their own home, they're gonna make the decision about whether Washington State's ready to lead the way and be the first state to legalize marijuana. When I filled out my own ballot, my hands were shaking. There was this kind of feeling of power of all of these pens together um, making this huge change. I voted yes on Initiative 502. I actually voted no, actually. I voted to approve. I voted against the Initiative 502. I voted to approve. I voted yes. I voted to approve 502. I voted yes because I like smoking weed. If the law was written better on the 502, I would have probably voted yes. I mean, I don't agree with the D DUI law that comes with it. It's a slippery slope. People should not be taking drugs. We've spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to uh, fix this drug problem. Legalize it, tax it, um, put money back into the system. What the feds should do is they should look at this as they have 50 different laboratories in which to see how marijuana should be regulated. I eagerly look forward to the possibility of taxing it. You just have not yet proven what will happen. I think it's a lot like alcohol. You're going to make the decision regardless of whether or not it's legal, so it doesn't really matter. And I think the state should make money on it, to be honest with you. One of my greatest fears is that I-502 will fail because it will set the movement back. If we lose this, the feds will see that as a mandate. The headlines will be, people reject marijuana legalization. We'll be waiting until the next presidential election, I fear, if then. I haven't been nervous until the last few days. I really want it to be a shout and not just a whisper. We knew logically it was going to be hard, but emotionally you're never ready for how hard it is. Not when it's this close and it's this big of a deal. Initiative 502 in King <laughs> County has earned 63.82%. and said, it is time for a new approach.
making a groundbreaking move here. This is this is landmark. This is historic. I'm so honored to be the city attorney in a city that is really trying hard to get it right. And it's what a, how fortunate we all are to live in a state that wants to lead this country, wants to make it a better place. I'll tell you one thing: the whole country is going to wake up tomorrow and look at Washington State and recognize that this is the beginning of taking apart prohibition one state at a time. That's how they did it 80 years ago against alcohol. That's how we're going to do it now against marijuana. The people who enjoy weed, marijuana enthusiasts, had a very good night at some of the polls last night. The vote is in, and Washington now joins Colorado in voting to become the first state to legalize and tax the sale of marijuana for recreational use. That means people can smoke it just for the fun of it. That could potentially prompt the rest of the country to take a long look at its current drug law. The move to legalize marijuana is causing ripples in Canada. Especially since one of the votes in favor was right next door in Washington state. Washington lui a voté à 55% en faveur de la consommation de cannabis. Für den, wie Sie es ausdrücken, recreational use, für den rekreativen Gebrauch. Legalisierung des использования cannabis, поскольку это противоречит федеральному закону. 法案的支持者表示，这项措施不是为了鼓励民众吸大麻。America it kind of says to me, back off. Our first thought was, well, what's sitting in our office? And I found 175 cases. Those cases just got shredded. The evidence will be destroyed. Rarely do we get to make that many people happy who've been charged with crimes all at once. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm Santa Claus, but I think I was charged with following the law. When people tell you that voting doesn't matter, tell them to talk to those 220 people in Washington state who won't be dragged into court for possession of a little bit of weed. And let's all thank Washington State voters tonight for once again proving that your vote matters. It's November 8th, Thursday, two days after the election, and we're shutting down campaign headquarters. I am putting up uh, stories about our victory on Facebook and Twitter, scheduling them for the next couple weeks. We're setting up the phones to cancel on the 16th, and we're done. We're taking down everything. We're going to be moving out today. It's a little bittersweet. I was really happy election night. I was really proud, and but I haven't gone through that. Um, yeah! I, I haven't done that yet, because I, Allison hasn't really been able to enjoy it yet. What we're hoping is that it's a political matter that the federal government will decide um, to work in collaboration with our state to implement the will of the voters. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> I can't breathe. <laughs> and I just missed another call that I have to return. It was absolutely overwhelming. I mean, and the numbers were insane. This wasn't just a squeaker. It didn't barely make it. This was a resounding yes. 55-45, I mean, a double digit margin. Okay, all you naysayers, you know, Washington is ready to the tune of 55%. In a few years, other states will see the wisdom in this and will look back on this and see this is indeed a turning point. I think the message will go across the United States and reach Washington, D.C. There will be kind of a domino effect. It'll be less politically dangerous for elected officials and bureaucrats to consider rescheduling marijuana. Marijuana to me feels like the next great sort of social issue um, politically in this country. Generationally, we're getting over our reefer madness concern. You know, people who have had exposure to it are not afraid of it. We've known for a long time that if you can just get the factual information out to Americans that they're gonna make the right choice. I'm really happy that the voters in Washington state expressed their will and they said, yes, we want legalization. And it was pretty clear they want legalization. What makes me sick is, of course, they didn't get legalization. For citizens who thought that they could just go to the store on the day this law went into effect and, and pick up an ounce, 
else. It's going to be a long time in coming, if ever. One of two things is going to happen now. Either the federal government's going to wipe the whole thing out, or they're going to wipe out all the stuff that's contrary to federal law, which is the distribution scheme, and you're going to be left with one ounce decrimmed, nowhere legal to buy it, and the disastrous changes to the DUI laws. I would be shocked if they didn't step in at some point over the next year and tell the state of Washington to stop your planning for the retail uh, distribution of marijuana. We need to take this up to the federal court system. What they got here, to be sure, is a Pyrrhic victory. There is no doubt in my mind that this is not going to result in any of the changes that they said it would result in. It couldn't. We could have had something like Colorado and all of us would have been happy. I mean, they wouldn't change the DUI law. They put home grow in. So in Colorado, you're going to get six plants. That's why I supported 64, even though I know it's preemptible, because it's not going to do any harm. Folks have been suggesting, let's get it on the books, and then we can fix the DUI provision. We can fix the no home grow later. The flexibility of being able to do uh, changes if they're needed is what's so great about 502. It's uncertain who's going to be the person to come and champion the let's lower this DUI provision. Here's one headline you will never, ever fucking see. Legislature reduces penalty for stoned driving. I think the whole thing has just been, you know, complete hypocrisy. Well, with respect to not going far enough, I think realistically we're making a sea change in marijuana policy here, and we really needed to meet Washington voters where they were. It's hard to argue with the, the way they did it. It's hard to, because it worked. However, the fact that legalization passed in such a tumultuous way just felt so unnecessary. People like Doug Hyatt were the foundation for movements like 502. And I guess that's part of the true irony of politics is that it takes a force like the one that Alison Holcomb was able to put together. History has been made with uh, marijuana legalization here in Washington State as well as uh, marriage equality. Interesting times. Alison Holcomb, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm hoping that they get held accountable for this and that they that they own it and that they you know aren't able to slide off the hook which is exactly what I think they're going to try and do We've never seen an opportunity like this. We think that in the United States, cannabis is, is currently about a $46 billion industry, and worldwide, uh, we believe it's in excess of $200 billion. To put it in perspective, cannabis is bigger than corn. We see this rolling out nationwide, and it's, it's inevitable at this point. We see the opportunities as limitless in the next five to 10 years. Maybe it has something to do with the great weed and the weather, but we know how to build things from scratch. We know how to take a cup of coffee and turn it from 60 cents to $3 and sell it all around the world. We know how to take a computer chip, box it and package it and put it in everyone's home around the world. People are truly, truly passionate and excited believing that this is where the change is going to happen. The next year is about how do you set this up so that it works right, so that it actually meets all those goals that you're hoping it will meet. Since 502 has passed, a lot of people are actually like accepting the reality that they're going to have to be legitimate business owners if they want to be in business, you know? It's a pretty dramatic departure in state law policy that we're going to take marijuana out of the hands of gangs and international cartels and put them in the hands of legitimate businesses. Now that's going to set up a showdown with the federal government. There's no question about that. It could go to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and it could go to the Supreme Court, and it could be on CNN and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and everyone could be talking about this fight. And you know what? That's the point. Midnight, there were cheers in Seattle as marijuana officially became legal in Washington State. An impromptu celebration was held, appropriately enough, at the Space Needle, a Seattle high point. Winds of change are blowing through Washington State this morning, and you might say they smell a little funny. 
recreational pot, anything less than an ounce, no longer illegal. It's amazing. I'm not a criminal anymore. I can't go to jail for small amounts of marijuana. I'm I'm free to be free. This is December 6, 2012. It's the day that uh, an ounce of marijuana becomes legal in the state of Washington, and we're here at Seattle Center at the Fountain, kind of the place where gatherings happen in Seattle, where something profound happens. Instead of coming in here and enforcing the law, they put on the fountain and started playing Hendrix and Pearl Jam for us. It's a surreal to be in Seattle, Washington, because I can actually legally smoke marijuana. This is just one of the greatest cities in the world, and I hope other cities get to follow in our path. I think the world after legalization looks shockingly like the world today. There's this idea that if we legalize marijuana, there's gonna be all these people in society smoking marijuana. Well, it's already happening. Marijuana is in every community, it's in every neighborhood. There's a grow house in every neighborhood right now. It's not just the fact that it's legal, but it's also the fact that it's completely accepted. You're sitting at the crest of a wave that hasn't even broken. It's just the beginning of the reform movement's victories. We know that this is uh, the beginning of something good. People are going to see that, oh, well, this is just kind of a pragmatic and relatively boring way to go about uh, changing how you deal with marijuana. Ten years from now, when people are no longer being locked up for smoking marijuana, I'm going to proudly say Washington State was the first state to lead the way. This is a groundbreaking red letter day. It's potentially uh, I-502 and Measure 64 passing in Washington, Colorado are potential game changers for prohibition. Instead of an iron curtain, it looks like a brick wall now and a few bricks have been, have been taken out. I think what everybody's wondering is at what point is it just going to come completely falling down. I have always thought that marijuana legalization was never going to be a first term issue for President Obama. And so what I'm hoping is that Washington and Colorado have created the space for him to be able to say, okay, we're going to let this go forward. <sighs> so fingers crossed. <laughs> President Obama, we've lived under the specter of the iron curtain of prohibition all of our lives. President Obama, tear down this wall. Hey, whether you ballin' or broke, wanna find the most hot? Just follow the smoke. Everybody wanna fly, but nobody wanna know how that whole thing started. Whenever you were born, yeah, go back farther. Deep in the jungles of the Ganges River, 2000 BC, see Hindus and Sikhs, shitloads of weed. Very first plant cultivated for the fabric. And anytime they burned it, the people started dancing. Medicine man put the people in a trance, then they transported west. Brought by brown farmers, shared with the Rastas, and said it's called ganja. Greeks and the Turks traded gold for dope, and soon Shakespeare smoked the shit and wrote dramas. Soldiers, Napoleon led rod civilians of stashes of hash. Took it back to France with him. Christopher Columbus, first drug smuggler. Slaves made to grow his shit, but smoked some of it to laugh at the master. Plotting his disaster, and everywhere the immigrant went, he had a drag bag. Mistaken, my bad, I'm just a messenger. Spitting Wikipedia raps, I got a Sean Kemp in my pocket, cutting in half. It's two Gary Paytons, don't ask, do the math. I know cats who got killed for the sack, who'd probably be alive if the market for that Bama wasn't bad. You put it in the hands of the many who mark territories and blood. Kinda scary, huh? Ain't even talking about the ones with the badge, the ones still waging that war inside their head. The same ones who probably could use a couple hits, and I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of fuckers did. 
Make you wanna roll up a J and say shit I ain't gonna be the one to get caught for doing this Cool, you gotta know the rules, how to live You wanna find a loopholes, do what I said As long as you ain't got 40 grams in your hand Can't get you with the felony delivery intent But anything less than that's a misdemeanor And legally a reason for police to take seizure Even with initiatives passed Decriminalizing the green grass They don't wanna see that Might as well get you a forever green pass Hit that dispensary fast Believe that this law's so flawed The foundation's done The more things outlawed The more outlaws run George Washington himself Probably puffed the chronic Now space gets exchanged for this shit Ironic That Bob Marley stage, that ganja ganja, that one love, bro. It's medicine that makes you stronger. It equated to me chilling, isolated in my apartment, blazing the eighth of day and playing Grand Theft Auto. Like, damn, I'm way more creative. creative. 20 minutes later, staring at the paper. The paper. Yeah, at 420, it was all about the love. Now it's 431, and I'm paranoid as a fuck. Like, who are these hippies? Uh, where are my real friends? Huh? Are you playing? Glorification. You are not Snoop Dogg. Moderation, that's the key. If the door is unlocked, it's up to you. How you use it, make the call. Come on. Okay.